Hi, this is Andrew Nimick of the Oregonian and Oregon Live. I cover recruiting for the University of Oregon, Oregon State University, and Oregon High School Athletics. I'm joined by high school football guru Jordan Johnson. Jordan, I wanted to talk about Oregon and Oregon State and the job these coaching staffs have done evaluating talent. And I know you've talked to a number of coaches who deal with Oregon State on a regular basis. How do they feel about Oregon State and the job they've done in the first nine months now in evaluating talent in this state? Well, I think, uh, you know, with the new staff, I mean, there's just a, there's a, there's a difference. And Coach Rowley did a great job. I, I mean, he, he didn't get a ton of kids out of Oregon, but recruiting to Corvallis, it's a, it's a different ball game versus Tucson, Tempe, L.A., Palo Alto, Berkeley. We could go on and on. So that said, I think Gary Anderson is, is getting accustomed to the state and his, his other coaches are doing the same thing. And grabbing four guys like we talked about a couple weeks ago is a big first step. But it's tough. I mean, it's, it's, a, different, it's a different role. It's a different area. So you got to definitely get a feel for who's legit, who's not. And, and, and what the Northwest provides. So I think it's a kind of a feeling out period right now. And we will see, especially because Oregon and Washington does have legit three, four star kids, we will see how much emphasis they put on this region moving forward. A few things about Oregon State. One, Gary Anderson is really well liked by not only coaches, but in-state players. And, and I hear that from a number of places, how much they like Gary Anderson, and I think that's a huge piece. Another thing that I think is really impressive is you talk to these high school kids, you talk to the high school coaches, Oregon State has made themselves visible. They're at games. People have seen Gary Anderson at games. People have seen offensive line coach TJ Woods, who recruits this area. They've seen him at games. And just seeing Oregon State at your games is a big deal because it's an area that I think Portland State and Oregon need to improve on a little bit, being visible. I don't often see Portland State green, you know, green Portland State hat or Oregon green and yellow stuff. You don't see that as much. And Oregon State's done a really good job. The receiver coach wore bright orange pants at the Oregon City game. You couldn't have missed him. I'm sure he did it on purpose. They've done a great job of being visible. And I think that's huge when you're a new staff is to get people excited that, oh my gosh, Oregon State is here. How cool is that? And, and I think to their credit, they've captured that excitement and, and run with it a little bit. So you take a look at like a Daniel Green or a David Morris or those kids that are ranked at the top of their position within Oregon. Those are Pac-12 athletes, unquestioned. Okay? Right. So Oregon State, it, it comes down to when are they going to offer him, not if. Because those Green, and, Green and Morris, as an example, you know, 6'3", 205, David and Daniel's 6'3", 225, both will be offered by plenty of mid-majors and other pac 12 So we will see with OSU how much love they give them early because – those are going to kind of kind of be the determining factors. Like how much how much do they respect those these Oregon kids? Because Ryan Nall, for example, I mean, huge score. The only Pac-12 offer he got was from Oregon State. Give credit to Riley and his staff. So we'll see with some of these top kids in Oregon for 2017, for example, what they do. We'll see if they offer early or if they sit back and wait and, and go after more of these, you know, Texas Cali kids. And I think that's the that's a key point, and it, it's a very good point. Is that they need to make sure, we need to see how they do at evaluating talent two and three years down the line. Because that's how you tell how well you have blanketed your state. When you know your state, you know the up-and-coming sophomores, you know the juniors, you know the seniors, you know everybody. And they came in late last year, right before, you know, six weeks or whatever before signing day. And they had to go back to their roots. They had to, you know, Sataki in Utah, Telly Lockett in, in Florida. They had to go back to their roots because they were in scramble mode to put their class together. This year they've been able to take that step away where they say, okay, let's really look at the seniors in this state and offer a couple. Now that we're getting into year two, you know, with the class of 2017, it'll really be interesting to see how well they know the state. Like you said, Madison linebacker Daniel Green is not a guy who people are going to see a whole bunch. He doesn't play for Jesuit. He doesn't play for Central Catholic. He's not going to be super visible. And yet he's 6'3", 225, and I think he runs a 4'5", maybe a 4'6". Uh, athletically, there's no question he's a Pac-12 player, and it'll be interesting to see if Oregon State recognizes that and jumps. Now, if they don't offer him, he might not fit what they do. So you can't say if they don't offer Daniel Green, they're doing it wrong, right? I mean, everybody has their preferences. At the same time, you want to see them start to identify those talents early and have them offer those kids or be involved with those kids or be visible at their games, not just Central Catholic games, not just Oregon City games, not just Jesuit games. Yeah, I think Portland State, 
as we can see by their 6-1 and one record and where they're at right now, got some big-time steals over the last couple of years where those kids should have been mid-major slash maybe Pac-12 type kids. And we'll see if Oregon State goes and gets a few of those type of guys. I mean, there's a couple of guys playing for PSU right now that are – first team, potential first team D1AA All-Americans, right? right? So we'll see if OSU um, pays attention and capitalizes on, on those type of athletes. And I think in, in general, we've talked about the Northwest getting better. There's so much more talent to evaluate. It is a harder job now. In some ways, it's easier because there's, it seems like all the major teams have a talent or two that's a potential Pac-12 Mountain West Conference level player. But at the same time, you have to sift through all that. And when you're new to a state... It's really hard to evaluate on film. Okay, Central Catholic is playing Reynolds. Okay, how good is Reynolds? Because we're seeing this kid dominate, Mm -hmm. dominate this Reynolds team. Is Reynolds not great? I mean, and Reynolds is just an example. I'm not trying to throw Reynolds under the bus or anything. But it's really hard when you're new to a state to evaluate on film. This kid looks electric. He looks amazing. Is Oregon that much better and this kid's really, really good? Or are they playing not very good teams and this kid just looks good against bad competition? And I think Oregon State's really starting to get their feet under them with that. Um, I want to talk about Oregon as well. I went and saw Justin Herbert on Friday night. I don't know if I could have been more impressed with his personality. Mm-hmm. Mark Helfrich was there. Scott Frost was there. And, and I interviewed him, and he, he was very flattering. He said, you know, you're here. Mark Helfrich is here, Scott Frost here, and I didn't really care that much. And it's not personal, but I just thought it was nice that, you know, he knew the Oregonian was there. He knew the TV stations were there. He knew Mark Helfrich and Scott Frost were there. And he didn't really care, and it didn't seem to bother him. I liked the touch he put on his passes. He only threw the ball down the field for more than 20 yards probably twice, completed both of them. Uh, He rolled out a number of times. He does a great job of turning his shoulders, getting squared, and firing, and it's a tight spiral. It's a nice pass. Um, I think the biggest thing, again, because a lot of it was screens, is leading his receivers, which a lot of guys don't know how to do, and touch. And that's not something you can really teach. That's either something that guys know how to do or don't. I think it's one area that Jacob Eason's the number one quarterback in the nation. I think that's his biggest weakness, mm-hmm. is he doesn't always know how to put touch on the ball. And Justin Herbert does. And I, and I was really impressed. And I know you've tooted his horn for a long time. Justin Herbert, go. <laughs> so, I mean, 6'6", 220, three-sport athletes, uh, pretty much good at whatever he does. He's that guy. Give credit to Oregon. I mean, regardless of when they offered him, they wanted to see if he came back from his injury and did his thing, which he did. But Justin, I think, is going to start for a couple years at Oregon and, and do really well. I mean, he's got a bunch of juniors around him at Sheldon, and he's – taking that, that leadership role and just makes everyone better. Kind of like the Stroms. You know, you put, you put Kellen Strom at quarterback last year and, you know, he's not going to go be a, a QB, but I mean, look, look at how well they did. Justin can sit back 660, 20, he can run, he can throw, he can do whatever you want him to do. So in an Oregon type environment, in a duck offense, I mean, we could see him, um, I think get better and better, which is crazy because He's going to be – I think Sheldon has a good a chance good a chance to win the title this year as anybody. And they have very few seniors on that squad. So, I mean, Justin, Justin's a player. That's a great transition, actually. Sheldon is one of those teams, and I think there are four at the 6A level that, that could win the state title. And Sheldon's the youngest, but they have, I think, the best leader, the best individual talent in the state in terms of at a key position. I think Brady Breeze might be the best talent in the state. He plays safety, doesn't have the same impact that Justin Herbert does at the quarterback position. But I think those four teams at 6A, Jesuit, Sherwood, West Lynn, Sheldon, I think those are your top four teams in 6A. I don't think it's debatable. Is that how you see it too? I, I could be wrong. <laughs> I've been wrong before. Yeah, we tiered them, I think, a few weeks ago, and, and those will be the top four as of right now. Oregon City and Central Catholic played earlier in the year. Central Catholic won by a point in overtime. But if you take like OC versus Clackamas and Central versus Clackamas, who just played, Oregon City blasted Clackamas. What was it, 52-14, 62-14, something like that. 62-14, yeah. And Central Catholic squeaked out a 17-14 win over Clackamas. So obviously it, it's not just that. Uh, black and white, but we Oregon City, I think, is legit, super legit. Daquan Dennis Lee, the junior quarterback, I, I think is going to be a kid that we hear more and more about. He's improving every week. And then Trevon's been on fire, as we talked about, doing his thing. So um, Jesuit with Tally, 25 touchdowns, a lot of yards, and 
37 seniors returning, seven kids that played in the state championship game two years ago. That's a ton of experience. And the thing with them that we talked about is they're going to play another regular season game, Beaverton, this week. A 7-1 and one Beaverton team. No disrespect, but I bet they beat them by 40 or 50. And, and then they're going to play a couple playoff games where they win by a lot of points. So they've got another month before their challenge. So that's going to be their deal when they finally see some competition what will you know who will show up but with regards to the talent jesuit is 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 definitely the number one i wanted to talk to you about tally actually of any kid in the state this year i think he's the kid that i hear about most on twitter in emails why don't you love this kid more where is his love to, to me not to you uh why do you not have him ranked higher can you explain to people because i think people have a hard time with this i think he's very talented but can you explain to people just how hard it is to be a Pac-12 running back. I think so many people think, why isn't Oregon on this kid? Why isn't USC on this kid? Why isn't Oregon State on this kid? He may be that level, but I don't think it's a slam dunk. And I think there are a lot of people in the state who watch football and say, well, Tally's obviously a Pac-12 player. And I don't think it's obvious. I think he could be. And I think he could develop into a very good running back. But I don't think it's obvious. Yeah, I would say go look at some of the other guys that have been offered. I mean, once again, that's where we're taking a look at the kids within the state of Oregon and the talent level versus the state of California. It's a sheer numbers thing, right? Cali's got 15, 20 times as many kids to choose from. I mean, a lot more kids, whatever the number is. But Tally is legit. 6'3", 215. He's going to have his way with most teams within the state of Oregon. But once again, you made a good point. When these guys are watching film, well, who are you playing against? How do we justify it, right? So before they offer a scholarship to a kid, they have the luxury of waiting on some of these Northwest kids because there isn't going to be UCLA, Stanford, a bunch of other guys coming in early. They can wait. And fair or not fair, that's what happens almost every year. They Before signing day, those two weeks before signing day, you see a ton of things happen, a bunch of action because – you know, the chips fall and people sign, commit, this and that. So with Jason, I think if he continues to do his thing, stays healthy, he'll have a lot of relevant activity much, much closer to signing day when other people have their guys sign. So we'll, we'll see, but I could definitely see some mid-majors coming in on him pretty soon. And then who knows, you know, from a, from a D1 standpoint, he, he's – there's been some guys that are very, very interested that we know of right now that are, that are D1 schools, and it just comes down to who's going to show him love first and, and what, um, you know, when they offer. How much are you hoping, <laughs> I'm certainly hoping, how much are you hoping Jesuit Sherwood, Westland, Sheldon end up somehow in those ridiculous OSAA power rankings one through four so we can see those semifinal matchups? Yeah. Is it that cut and dry? I mean, those are the matchups we want to see in the semifinals, right? Yeah, that'd be, uh, that'd be pretty sick. I, I hope uh, – I mean, Sherwin and Les Westland, by the time they get done with regards to um, strength of schedule with the TRL, I've never seen a conference, I don't think, as strong top to bottom as the Three Rivers League. If you took South Salem, who's undefeated and ranked – I think the Oregon Live has them six or seven or something like that. This is, once again, a sound – it won't sound – won't sound good, but if you put them in the TRL, they're maybe a, a, a one-win team. That's, that's, right. that, that's real. They would win maybe a game in the TRL, and they're undefeated in, in the Greater Valley Conference. Right. So to put that into perspective, um, I mean, Sherwood and West Lynn are battling every week. Lake Oswego, Tigard, um, the whole group, right? So we'll see how much energy they got come the semifinals or the state championship if we were to see a, a Final Four like that. So those are the four teams we like. We also talked about Oregon City. I think you're right. I think they're a little bit ahead of Central Catholic. And then I think Tiger's a sleeper because they have so much – they have a good offensive line and they've got so many young playmakers who have developed. The 5A, I think, is a different story. I don't think it's as cut and dry that there are four teams. How do you see 5A? You are locked in on 5A in a way that I am not. I think I've only been to 6A games this year except for one. How do you see 5A shaking out? So there's a lot of interesting things. I mean, it's, it's, inter, it's, it's similar to, to 6A, and there's about six teams that are in that top tier, probably four or five uh, with regards to Crater beating number one – well, it was number one Springfield last week, and now Crater is undefeated, as is Liberty, who got that 40-37 to 37 win over Wilsonville without Johnny Neville. So the top four teams, Crater, Liberty, Springfield, Wilsonville, and then Summit. I really, really like Summit and what they've done without – Cam McCormick and Kyle Cornett. Kyle Cornett is a baller. He's a kid that 
he, he went for 11 touchdowns, 1,025 yards as a sophomore, all-conference kid, playing with both of those guys. Drew, uh, John Bledsoe threw five touchdowns last week. I think he's got 20 on the season. He's rushed for another six. So he's in his groove. So between those four that we referenced, Summit and then Ashland, who's, you know, they actually beat Summit by a point. Um, those six teams seem to be in your your common tier, uh, kind of like we, we, we talked about with the 6A. But Crater, 8-0, Matt Strzok, 6'3", 210, quarterback, just throwing dimes, and he's been he's been a guy. They went to Springfield and won that game 49 to 35, and it's been fun. I mean, because 5A, truthfully, when Sherwood was down there, I mean, they just beat people, right? It wasn't even. It was like, okay, so let's just get through this to the state title game, so Sherwood can win by 40 and we can go home. Um, but the the this is has been pretty cool because they've got some teams with some players and a Connor Neville, for example, who's got a couple D1 offers. Quarterback at Wilson. Quarterback at Wilsonville. Kalen Hemphill. Bunch of bunch of offers, so we got including some, Oregon State or, linebacker from Liberty. Linebacker, there you go, and you know he's got Hawaii and a bunch of other guys. So um, it's it's fun. Springfield, I love Dave Heiberger, the head coach there. I talked to him last week. Uh, four year starting quarterback Trevor Watson, uh, done a done a phenomenal job. They have seventeen starters returning, so they could very well make a run as well. Um, but I like five A. Five A is going to be this will be one of the the best years for five A that we've had in some time. Who? Who are the top two or three guys at the 5A level? I'd say I think it's pretty clear Cam McCormick's one, got his offer from Oregon, but he had offers from, from all over the West Coast. Michigan got involved late. Um, he committed to Oregon. Uh, you got Kalen Hemphill, who has six or seven offers now, Oregon State, including uh, in the mix. Connor Neville's a junior. He's got offers from Washington State and Boise State to play quarterback. Is there anybody else at that 5A level that's going to make the playoffs that is a must-see talent? I know Matt Strzok's a great athlete, Will that transition? So with Wilsonville, for example, Johnny Neville, 6'4", 200-pound receiver. That's a junior. They also have junior Harrison Steiger. Who Love is that kid. Super legit. Love that kid. Yeah, he is the real, he's the real deal. Him and Johnny and Justin Altenhofen, another junior who is Tanner Shipley's younger brother, Tanner okay. Shipley, player of the year, now at Boise State. Those three are all juniors and all coming back with Neville. So – they have, I mean, if we're talking this year and next year, that's going to be a lot of fun, right? They're going to throw on the season. They've got, you know, Connor's got uh, 26, 27 touchdown passes, and um, those are three, six, th- so 6'4", 200, 6'3", 185, 6'2", 175, good-sized kids with D1 genes, and I, I really like what Adam Gunther is doing over there at Wilsonville because they're playing D, too. I mean, 40 to 37 doesn't necessarily say that, but those were two good teams battling back and forth. And Liberty is a senior-based team this year, a ton of seniors. Wilsonville's primarily juniors. I got my start at the Oregonian covering the Hillsborough schools, and that Liberty team was getting thumped pretty regularly with all these sophomores. And they were talented, and they made some big plays, but they made a lot of mental mistakes because they were young, and they were you know, out physical uh, a lot of the time. Those guys are all seniors now. It's, it's that whole group, and they had talent. They had a sophomore quarterback and a sophomore running back and mm-hmm. sophomore linebackers across the board. Uh, those guys are all seniors now, and they're studs. Braden Buffaro, Devin Thompson, mm-hmm. uh, Kalen Hemphill. I think that's their starting three linebackers. Yeah. Those guys are monsters. All three of those guys would play in the TRL and be good, I think. I think yeah. they would start and play in the, TR, in the TRL, which says something about those guys. I, they have an exciting defense that can make plays. To hold Wilsonville to 37, now we say hold Wilsonville, but that's a pretty good effort. Mm-hmm. I saw Wilsonville a couple weeks ago, and Connor Neville had over 400 yards and seven touchdowns at halftime. Mm-hmm. So they're pretty explosive. <laughs> yeah, Connor is uh... – He's a special kid, and before he's done him, he's got Washington State and Boise State offers right now. He'll have, you know, he'll have ten plus, and I'm talking big, big time offers. Sure. I mean, he is, he's, he's the real deal. So it'll be fun to watch him and his brother Johnny. I mean, that's the thing. If we're talking uh, early offers, I don't know with him, Steiger, Alton, often, but I do know that um, with regards to the time that's spent and being kind of sneaky fast and, 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 and running crisp routes. Those are kids that are going to win 90% of their one-on-one battles and break a lot of rest records statistically over the next couple of years. Quickly, I wanted to go over top player in each class real quick, um, starting with 2016. Top player in the state. Brady Breeze. Okay, I think so too. I think this year he's established himself. He's ahead of, of Lamar at this point. Mm-hmm. Just – 
production standpoint, Lamar's had some injuries. I think he's he's one. I think he'll start as a I think he'll play as a freshman and start as a sophomore at at Oregon. And I think he'll he'll be a all conference kid for a couple of years and, and get an opportunity at the next level. I think he's that good. I think he's he's just his 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 body control, his ability um, his knowledge of the game, just the way he is, no matter what he's doing on or off the field, he's just a very talented individual. And you take that with his um, ability to anticipate, think, just everything that he does, because we've seen I've seen it now for, for a couple of years. And he's just a very impressive kid. I mean, he's, he's more impressive off the field. So we're talking the whole package. I just, you can't really go wrong with, with an athlete and a person like that. Never seen a kid whose measurables less define how they play. I think he measured just under six feet. He ran like a four seven five at the opening, and people wrote him off. And then they tried to throw at him a little bit. He had an interception and swatted everything down mm-hmm. and was physical. Just kind of made people look silly a little mm-hmm. bit at the opening. Really talented kid. Class of 2017. Oof. I mean, Elijah. You got you to say, you, you gotta say Elijah. I mean, Elijah is one of the best players ever to – ever to come out of Oregon. I just have to talk real quick. David Morris and, and Anthony Adams, two of my favorite athletes. I just I think those guys, we're talking early offers, especially David with his size. I mean, OSU and schools like that need to be on him right now. Daniel Green, same thing. There's no reason those kids should not have an offer right now from somebody. And I think they will soon. But the, if, if Big Skies haven't offered yet, I would like to know why. Yeah. I mean, what, what's your reasoning? Because – it's just they're not going to end up at a big sky. They're going to be playing at a much higher level. So I'm, I'm just, you know, <laughs> definitely a good question. D- David Morris is my guy. Um, I started doing this and went to a camp and saw this kid that was tall, long arms, and you could see that he'd fill out really nicely. And he just moved so well for 6'3", 200. And I said right away, who is that kid? And you said, you don't know that kid yet? <laughs> and I said, no, you know, I haven't seen him yet. And you said, that's David Morris. And then I, it clicked, and I remembered him, and it was like, oh, God, that guy's a yeah. beast. But David Morris is my guy. And Elijah Molden's the best, the best guy in the class of 2017. Yeah. It's not close. Yeah. Um, he's, he could go anywhere in the country and be a productive lockdown player. He allowed one completion as a sophomore in high school at the varsity level. Stud. But David Morris is really good. He's a great football player, and he's a nice kid, and I hope, I hope it works out for him. And Big Sky, wake up. Yeah. <laughs> class of 2018. I mean, we, we know Dawson and love Dawson, just a phenomenal talent, ranked the number, what, 10 athlete in the country or, or something, something in there. Uh, maybe the top lineman, one or two in, in the nation right now. Um, there's Braden Lindsey, Chase Coda. I mean, Chase Coda's in a different category as well, ranked the number three receiver in the nation. So if we're, if we're separating Dawson and Chase on a national level, those are two kids, national recruits, probably offered by pretty much everyone before all is said and done. But I really love looking at some of those sophomores right now, the 2018s, the Braden Lindsay, the Talanoa Hufanga out of Crescent Valley, uh, whose brother is currently a linebacker at Oregon State. I know OSU is very aware of him. But those are the people. He started as a freshman quarterback at Crescent Valley. He, he won't be a quarterback in college, but those are the type of kids that – are just exciting, in my opinion, to watch now. Well, that for me, that's why I go to your guys' camps, and that's why I go to those camps is I saw him and immediately came up to you guys, and I think you guys like it because I get so excited coming up, mm-hmm. and I was like, who is that kid? Because I haven't seen him yet. And I'm thinking you're going to say, you know, he's a junior at Roseburg or something, you know, and like, oh, he's a freshman, he's the starting quarterback, and he started in basketball. Mm-hmm. He made it to state last year in track as a freshman. Uh, and I just could, I said, there's no, there's no way, there's no way that kids, no, that one right there. <laughs> and you said, yeah, he's, he's a freshman yeah. at Crescent Valley, uh, stud and, and Pac-12 player, no question. Absolutely. Him, Trey Lowe, uh, we did, a, I did a thing with, uh, Talanoa, Trey. And, I like Trey Lowe. Uh, I do. I really like him. Yeah. I didn't see a lot from him early and he has just burst onto the scene this year and gone from a kid you dream on to a productive Stud, and I, I really like Trey Lowe. I think he's going to be a great player too. Six touchdowns in the last three weeks, I want to say it's something ridiculous. like that, and, and that's why Tally's running for four games, so you can only get the ball so many times. Right. But uh, yeah, Trey Braden Lindsay's averaging thirty-five point three yards a catch, six touchdowns in the last three games. 
Um, and, you know, he's a sophomore. He's, as we talked about, started as a freshman at Tigard, which is incredibly unique. And he's already visited Washington. I mean, he's, he's on the Pac-12 radar already. There's no doubt he's a Pac-12 player. It's really exciting because we wanted to do this quickly, and we got, to th- we got through 2016, okay. We get to 2017, 2018, and you just start to get excited. And it's like, and the reason is people don't know these guys yet. Everybody's so excited about Brady Breeze, Lamar Winston, Cam McCormick because they're committed. And so Oregon and Oregon State fans are already going, how are our guys doing? And what people don't understand is the next wave of our guys is going to be these, you know, Daniel Greens, the Anthony Adams, and, and people don't know about them yet. And it's really, it's really exciting to see those kids, and I know you've done this for years, I've only done it a couple, to see these kids at, as freshmen and sophomores and go, oh, he's going to play for Oregon, Oregon State. Yeah. And then to watch their development and watch him go, for me, from being really shy, and I'll talk to him and I'll say, I, I think you're a Pac-12 player. And they, to see their faces like, what? You know, no one's ever told me that before. And... To interview them and they're nervous and kind of scared and they want to say the right things and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in a newspaper. And then to watch that transition to like sometimes not being able to get hold of them because they're hearing from 15 coaches in a day. It's really fun. It's a, it's a lot of fun to see that, that maturation. Yeah, it's uh, the guys that, you know, the Elijah Moldens, the Chase Cotas, they're going to, they've been showing a lot of love from a really young age. And I think it's cool to project on some of those kids that like you said people don't know about because no one's talking to them right now at age 15 16 but anyone that's been in the know can watch them play and see their dominance and say that will be a kid we watch play on Saturday potentially Sunday you know in the years to come and it's like you said it's fun to just kind of say sit back and watch for a couple of years and see what they do sure. because they don't even know they right. don't even know what's gonna and and we've seen enough now to know that like you know, hey kid, you're, it's gonna it's gonna be a good couple of years, so uh, enjoy. Well, Dawson was the most fun, and I and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn talking about a conversation I had with his dad. But I said I called him and said he's he's the number ten player in the country. The the rankings came out, and he said, "Oh, great, he's a top ten lineman," and because he just didn't it just didn't register, and he knew his son special, but like he just didn't think number ten player in the nation. And uh, I think he either called or texted me back, and he said. Not for linemen in the whole country. And I was like, yeah, I've been telling you how great he is. And yeah, that's how good he is. Yeah. And it, it's really fun to see these parents and, and the kids, especially when they're good kids. And I think Oregon's blessed in, in the sense that all these kids so far have been really great kids. There isn't that kid that you go, God, you know, I know he's a four-star kid, but I kind of <laughs> hope he fails because he's a jerk. That doesn't exist here, mm-hmm. at, at least that I've noticed. Great point. I mean, these kids... Um, Alex Lennon-Cole, former Oregon State, three-year All-Pac-12 lineman, trains Dawson, and that's one of the first things that he brings up is just what a phenomenal kid he is. And Dawson's great, unbelievable. I mean, just and we people just sit here and think we blow smoke. It just to talk about, you know, no, these kids are really, really. Chase Cota is one of the, the nicest people you'll ever you'll ever come. That across. whole family, family's Br- phenomenal. Brady the breezes, and Chase, yeah, are amazing. Yeah, just great, great people. Alex Brink, probably the top quarterback coach anywhere in this in this region. Um, you know, when you hear him talk about a kid, he's speaking from experience and playing at a professional level. And so you listen and you take that stuff in because he has, you know, he has the ability to say, look, I, I've seen what a kid looks like in the you know, a top, a top D1 type QB like he was and then an NFL top QB. And then he can absolutely relay that information and say this kid is projected um, to that level right now. That's That was what was so fun for me when I started my job, too. And we're running long, but who cares? Uh, people can listen to it or turn it off. We're going to talk ch- uh, talk shop for a minute. Um, that was what was exciting for me is I went and went to a couple camps and found you guys and, and found Taylor Barton. And I could talk to you guys about – I could get excited. And I know you guys, when you first saw me, I'd be so excited and be like, did you – oh, my God, this guy. And, and you guys are like, yeah, this is what we see all the time. And it was so fun for me to learn through you guys about what to look for. And, and I feel like I had a pretty good grasp coming in. But there's that little extra stuff now that I know that was a lot of fun that, that you don't necessarily get to see in a high school football field that you do get to see in these camps because they're in tank tops and shorts. Mm-hmm. And you can see the body. You can see the fluidity of the hips. You can see the way they move. You can see how physical they are. You put a kid in pads, and there are a lot of kids who will throw their bodies around they, they don't care. You put a corner against a bigger receiver when he's not in pads and he punches him in the chest off the line and you go, oh, that kid's not afraid of anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been fun for me. Yeah, I think, uh, 
you know, having you out to, to do your thing. You do a great job with, with covering the Northwest. And I think, you know, Oregon Live, this isn't a, a sit here, pat, pat on the back session, but you have done so much for high school football um, that the Northwest didn't always have. And I think it's brought a lot of attention and, you know, relevancy to our region because now we're seeing 30 D1 kids almost every year. We had a year, you know, like 2000. 15 where there wasn't um, that many, but 13, 14, phenomenal year. 30, 35 uh, D1 kids. We're going to have similar numbers in 16 and 17, potentially 18. So I think this is becoming much more um, real. And the more attention we, you bring to these these kids, the athletes, families, um, you know, the more fun it'll be when we get to watch them play on Saturday and Sunday. Well, thank you. But yeah, Daniel Green, Anthony Adams, David Morris. Get on those kids, Big Sky. <laughs> Get on those kids, Pac-12, because they are talented. Thank you very much, as always, for joining us. We'll do it again next week. Absolutely.